My name is Mia Bays and I run Bird's Eye View and we are uh, a um, cultural agitator and um, a campaign to bring ever greater audiences to come for women. Um, primarily in the UK, we are usually in cinemas um, at the moment, as I think you're coming to us in New York. All our cinemas are closed. It's kind of heartbreaking. However, thank God and the goddesses from Mubi who <laughs> are streaming um, an amazing array of films, including your new film, Dead Pigs, um, Kathy Yan. So I would like to welcome Kathy Yan to um, us to be live in conversation. It's wonderful to have you. We've been following your career rapidly. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, so, um, yeah, the, so, so Dead Pigs just came out um, on Mubi in the UK, and that's three years after its, its Sundance premiere. We've been following it avidly since then. Mm -hmm. And eight years after, a lot of pigs started <laughs> dying in Shanghai. Yep. And this film led to directing Birds of Prey, starring Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn. And we're going to talk a little bit about that, but we're largely going to focus on this amazing creature debut. Um, and I want to start at the beginning, actually, and kind of actually tee up how you got into film. You were a journalist initially, and then you became a filmmaker. Did, did you choose this path, or did kind of film choose you? Hmm, probably a little bit of both. I mean, I um, was a little late to the game in the sense that I only decided to go to film school or choose to take the risk, because let's be honest, it is a risk. Um, to enter the film industry, if you will, when I went to uh, film school, grad film school at NYU. And I also got an MBA at the same time. And I was already a journalist at that point and had spent a few years as a journalist. And I think for me, it was something that I always wanted to do, but felt like I didn't know how, and it was very risky. And I actually remember sort of being on the other side, um, like you, and in, in interviewing some um, directors and feeling like, oh, I Actually, I do really like this. I really, and I like the people that I'm meeting. I, I feel um, very close to, or I, you know, the types of personalities of directors that I was also meeting as well and, and what they were interested in. And then I, luckily for me, I had a friend who had just gone um, to, to NYU film school as well. So I was able to sort of hear from him, his experience there. And one thing led to another, but then when I was finishing film school, I just, I'd written uh, the script for Dead Pigs actually in my third in my third and final year wow. of film school, um, and it came quite rather quickly to me. And it was less like now I'm going to become a director, <laughs> and it was more like let me just see if I can make this movie. Um, and so it Dead Pigs was deeply important in terms of that because uh, in that way I think it selected me because I don't know if I would have even had the courage to say I'm just gonna try writing and try directing and see what happens. It was more like, I really want to make this movie and now I've got a script in my hand um, to make it. Mm -hmm. And where did your love of film start? Did you watch films as a kid? Did you go to the cinema regularly? I did, yeah, I'm, I'm an only child. <laughs> so I had a lot of time on my Me hand. Me too. Yeah, and, um, and my father was really, really into art house cinema. And I remember um, watching, I grew up watching um, a lot of like the early Zhang Yimou films and Chen Kang Gu, like there was that incredible era of like yep. amazing mainland Chinese yep. films and also just, you know, Wong Kar Wai and a lot coming out of Taiwan and, and Hong Kong. And so I think that was really uh, formative and instrumental for me too, because one, I was exposed to cinema, like art house cinema, really good films early on, but also I think it helped that the people look like me and that there were really interesting characters really interesting stories that were being told with people um, that I could relate to. And, and I think in many ways, Dead Pigs is an homage to that too. Um, to a film filmmaker. Wow, okay, wonderful. Well, let's come back to that actually, the kind of how you sort of, um, you know, your inspirations and your very kind of particular style. I think you have a very definite confident style and maybe we'll, we'll kind of break that down, how, that, how, how you came to that. Um, but let's start actually, so Dead Pigs was inspired by a true incident in 2013. So walk us through how that sparked the idea for a film, because it's quite an extraordinary starting point. 
<laughs> well, I had heard about the incident and I used to be a journalist that covered China. So I had this whole like memory bank of r ridiculous stories and phenomena that I that I, I had reported on or just heard about um, that I found all very interesting and all very illuminating, I think, in terms of what the bigger things and the bigger ideas around a society that is undergoing so much change and, you know, the sort of interesting um, contrast of a uh, supposedly communist country and one that was deeply capitalist in other ways. And so that was the type of change that I was reporting on that I had witnessed over my, my entire lifetime going back and forth between China and the US. And so I think um, those stories all just stayed with me. And, and one, another one that really stayed with me was the concept of the nail house, which is the house that Candy lives in, um, in the film. And this was a phenomenon and continues to be in China where, you know, homeowners don't want to leave and um, there's been so much urbanization and um, they kind of have you know turn into this standoff between uh, the homeowner and the developer and that was something that I'd been interested in as early as university when I did a thesis on it and so all of these stories just kind of stayed in me and I didn't quite know what to make of it and I didn't think it would be anything and then I read about the dead pigs incident and to me um, oddly enough, I was like, well, this is just so fascinating and, and, and deeply cinematic in a weird way. Um, and it felt so uh, representative and metaphorical to, I think, a lot of the bigger ideas that I was, I was starting to play with. And then when I started writing the script, all these stories that had, I'd just been hearing about and, and, and storing, I guess, in my memory somewhere just kind of came out through these characters. And you have a really big array of characters. I mean, it's an incredible piece of confident writing for to 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 map everything out and then and then end in an incredible musical number. Um, <laughs> like how talk us through the kind of writing and the story process. Like how did you map it out so that everything kind of interweaves so kind of beautifully, but not in a cliched, obvious way either. Thank you. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I think I remember, I, I tend to work off of two things. One is just images that come to me. Um, and sometimes they're inexplicable. Like I, I had very early on the image of Candy on a rooftop with a um, bulldozer. And <laughs> it just felt right. I think I had read somewhere, again, just back in my memory somewhere, I'd read something about, um, you know, a standoff with a house owner where they, they stood on the roof. And actually, I think it was a lot, it was a lot darker. I think they actually self-immolated um, on top of the roof. Oh but you know, some element, I, I think I was just drawing from all of these different uh, things that I'd read about over the years. And so there was that starting point of just all these various images that I had, the images of the dead pigs. Um, and then simultaneously, I just started to think about characters and, and, and characters that I'd met, characters that I found interesting. Um, Candy was, again, um, very much uh, uh, drawn, uh, was an, it was inspired by a real woman who had her own nail house. Um, as, actually, it was a case study that I worked on in, in university. And, and she was this kind of vibrant, vivacious character that the media loved. She had a husband, but... Um, you know, all of these little details, I think a lot of it was just research, really, and, and not deliberate research, but more like research that I, I just, I was just deeply fascinated by, by all the stuff that was happening in China. And so it was just research that I just did over the years that I just read about and put away, never thought about again, and it just kind of naturally came out through the process. And, and I think in terms of the connective tissue, it felt very organic to me. Like, I, I know, you know, I have had, I, I know people who, um, you know, have had those kind of strained relationships with their, you know, with their parents, for example, and, and it, 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 a lot of it just came out of my questioning around like, well, how, what, who are these types of people? How did they get there? And what are the, you know, what are the pressures on them? And what are the circumstances that force them to do something like this, whether it's dumping the pigs in the river, or, you know, crashing into cars, um, so that you can get some money, um, or choosing to stay in your home whenever, when the developers want you out. Um, so this, that was the main line of questioning. Who are these people and, and how did they get here? Mm -hmm. Wonderful. It's an amazing job. Um, and the film's so kind of richly cinematic as well. One of my favourite sequences is where um, um, Candy is framed in, her house is framed in neon. And then, and then you link every character who's sort of in thought 
and they're all framed by neon. Oh my God, that's fabulous. So just, I mean, just picking up on that point, but you know, how did you put um, your, how did you kind of then start to sort of build your tableau and, you know, how did you decide on your, your kind of framing, your, um, also the design is wonderful. And, you know, particularly because it sort of feels like it illustrates, it feels like it's, it's social surrealism. It feels real, but, but very heightened. So sort of talk us through your kind of approach to building the film that way. Thank you. And I love that term, social surrealism. I'm going to have to uh, utilize that. Um, I think that was always the inspiration. It's like the world, the, it's, China is a very, um, it, it's very kitschy, it's very broad, it's very earnest, it's deeply um, like just bombastic and, and larger than life and very, very surreal. I mean, a, again, a lot of everything that, almost everything in the film is a reference to some real life um, you know, phenomenon or, or occurrence. And so whether it's you know, the Sagrada Familia being built in China, I mean, there are multiple, um, there are multiple residential complexes that are essentially, you know, one-to-one -one replicas of various European, um, how you know, buildings and monuments and whatnot. And so, so much of it just felt absurd already. And so I just try to capture that. And, and then obviously with the singing at the end, I knew that I needed to heighten, um, you know, the, the, the story and the world and create a tone that would allow for the singing to feel natural at the end and not like we completely you know, swerved um, somewhere else. And so I think the color was an element of that. Again, it was a reaction to the use of color and neon in China. There's just a lot more color in China. The, it just, it's everywhere. Um, and so we really took that into it and just dialed it up a notch. I think the, the idea was to just take everything that was real and natural and that we're witnessing in China and just, you know, dial it up one degree. Um, in order to create this a slightly more heightened world. And it was very deliberate the way that we shot it too. We felt like we wanted it to feel vast and epic and we shot with anamorphic lenses on a super wide lens. Um, and a lot of it is in these wides because so much of the story is about context. It's about the context of these people and about essentially the individual against society and these larger currents of change. And so it was, deeply important to me that every frame had an element of that. And we were also very lucky because even though we didn't have much budget or money, I mean, so much of Shanghai is just deeply cinematic. And it's like, well, why not show more of this? Why not show the bar? Why not show this incredible view that we have? And, and so a lot of it just came out of that too. But I think um, that more classic way of shooting it that paid homage to some of these um, uh, directors that I mentioned before and having it be a little more designed and a little smoother and a less a little less of that cinema verite again just hinted at this like there's a little bit of a um, deliberate self-aware uh, filmmaking element to it that I think hopefully paid off at the end um, with little shifts there so yeah all of it kind of Came together in that way and of course there was also the music and 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 the performances themselves and I, I just see every tool in the toolkit um, available to me in order to, to kind of create that world and, and the tone and the vision of the film. Mm -hmm. And you it was a very low budget correct it was shot so shot in Shanghai and then you finished it in New York is that right so just talk us through what were the kind of challenges because that's quite an ambitious feat for your first feature. Yeah, I mean, the budget's always a challenge and we kind of made it work. I mean, at one point our, you know, rain machine was literally just two PAs with a, <laughs> with a hose. Um, that did not work well. Never do that. That is not where you want to save money. That was a deep, deep mistake. <laughs> so we have some good, we have now um, probably, you know, now, now everyone's going to watch the film and like try to look out for it. But uh, yeah, there's some good rain shots and some not so good rain shots. We, uh, we had to save it a little bit in post. But um, yeah, you're just constantly trying to make it work. But there was something also freeing. And in China, there isn't, um, it's not as much unionized, uh, which, you know, is unfortunate for 
for most of the crew and I tried not to take advantage of it, but it was nice, you know, for a first time, for, for a first feature to be able to kind of work at the pace that you needed to work with. And we got away with a lot of stuff that we would never be able to get away with here, frankly. Um, it was a little bit of like the Wild West or the Wild East in terms of filmmaking out there. Um, and a lot of people just, you know, did it for very little money because they just believed in the project. And 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 I love that. I love that, that indie sensibility and that indie spirit. And, um, it was really, really nice to make it that way. And, you know, and we cut the film literally in my living room in New York. So, so we were running out of money fast. <laughs> wow. And, and can, what, can you share your experience of sort of two languages and two cultures and kind of how, what that brings to the work and what that brings to the perspective on, on Chinese culture and the different representations, but also the, the American characters within as well. You've got a kind of double dual gaze yeah, I mean, that was always in, um, important to me because I felt like, and I, I think now there's really starting to become this kind of more international cinema. And, you know, a lot of people like me, especially coming out of the, the US, but elsewhere too, that have that sort of du dual identity and they're making work that represents that and shows that perspective. And I think for me, it was just natural. It was not something I deliberately chose to do, but I knew right away that Dead Pigs was not gonna just be like your average um, Chinese art house film. Um, and even though I had Jia Zhangke as, as my executive producer, but I just naturally am not Jia Zhangke and I'm not, you know, a local Chinese filmmaker. And so naturally the sensibilities and the tone and the storytelling was going to be a little bit different. And so I just had to lean into that really and, and, and try to tell a story that was very specific to a moment in time in China that was deeply international. And really, you know, it, for me, it was like so wonderful because I had to make as an outsider or in the U.S. as an outsider. And it was kind of nice in the years that I was working in China or spent some time in China as an expat because I felt very at home. It was like both of my cultures were sort of well represented there. And it was always important to me to showcase that level of internationalism and global like and, 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 and this playing around with nationality and identity in the film itself. Um, through, you know, through the character of Sean Landry too, because so much of my time in China, um, after I grew up, after I grew up elsewhere and going back there as a reporter was in this expat community. And I always found it so interesting and fascinating that there would be um, the reverse, I think of what you would think of as the immigrant American dream, right? People who didn't speak English and, um, and would move to America for all the opportunities and, and sacrifice so much. And then I was seeing the opposite happening. So many people moving to China without speaking Chinese, without any family or friends there because of the opportunities afforded to them there. And I just found that so interesting. And no one really talks about that. And I think for the West, there's a lot of people who just think of China in a very specific way. Um, and it's none of those things. It was actually, it's a, actually a very, very global place. And I love um, the kind of representation of animals, particularly obviously the pigs <laughs> that we know in the title, but the pigeons that Kansas a keep of pigeons, it's just beautiful, those scenes and her love for them. And, and the kind of like the natural space and the rhythms of the natural world and the clash with the built up world. So can you talk us through your kind of approach to those themes because they feel like you're really, you've thought about this. So like walk us through that. Thank you. I mean, I just, I love animals. So I, I was just joking that like with Birds of Prey, I should just continue this animal trilogy or something. Um, but I, I just find them so pure and so innocent and like so very much a repercussion in many ways, like so representative of a way that we used to live and a repercussion of um, some of the um, tougher choices that we've we've made as, as, as specifically humans. Um, and And so, you know, whether it's I think Candy in a way is able to have better relationships with her animals, whether it's her dog or her pigeons than with other humans uh, because of the type of person that she is and the nostalgia that she has in a country that is so deeply fascinated by the future. And so it just felt right to me to surround her with animals and have that sort of empathy um, because I think animals like tend to, you know, draw out that type of empathy and they themselves have that there's just an innocence to them. And, and the pigeons themselves came about because my, I was asking my mother and she had a friend who basically was a 
was the middleman between developers and people who had these townhouses that didn't want to leave. And he actually talked to her or showed us a contract that he had where they um, they had priced out all these pigeons from one of these um, homeowners who had these homing pigeon races. And then that that led me down this whole rabbit hole of like, whoa, there are people who, you know, train homing pigeons. And, and the metaphor, um, I mean, maybe it was too on the nose, but the metaphor of a homing pigeon that only recognizes one home and you can't just like take it away um, felt really right and also just felt so candy to me. Um, so it kind of just naturally made its way into the story. And we actually had to train these pigeons ourselves. We had baby pigeons and train them and fed them and um, house them at the house so that they could recognize that house. And, and so we could have that shot too when, when they're all released and they, they fly around the house. We actually wasn't quite sure they were gonna do it, but they did. <laughs> Great directions. Uh, actually, that seamless segue into actually how you worked with all your players, so pigeons and uh, humans. Um, I mean, it's a, you've got kind of quite big arcs as well, and you've got quite a number of characters. So, kind of, it would be lovely to hear your kind of approach with the, the a actors' collaborations and and yeah, what you're like directing actors because the, the the performances are fabulous. Well, thank you. Yeah, I love. I love playing with the actors. To me, um, you can't possibly write or anticipate the best moments that you can find on set if you allow, if you collaborate with your actors. I, I, I think that like, it is a fallacy to think that like, you spend your entire time directing so that you can get to that perfect shot or perfect image that you had in your mind's eye. I mean, you try to have that and then you try to get surprised by it, I think. And so um, I quickly learned to um, sort of allow that kind of freedom on set. And, and partially it was because half of it was in, China, or more than half was in Chinese. And then of the Chinese, a good amount of that was in Shanghainese, which is a dialect that I understand, but I don't speak. And, and so I had to give um, a lot of uh, ownership in a way to the actors who did. And I realized very quickly that that was perfectly fine. I mean, I don't know if I want to ever like direct in Spanish, which I don't understand at all, but like it was, it was nice to free my, free them and free myself from um, being um, too close or too, too focused on, you know, whatever the script was saying or hitting their mark or doing anything like that. So I try to remove all of those distractions from it so that they're not thinking up here, but that they're just feeling. And a lot of my direction ended up being um, playing off of each other. So it's less about what, um, the, as the scene was written, but more like, do you understand your character and where you are among within this arc and what the scene is about? Um, and then let's just play and really play. Like I'll give completely different direction on, you know, for one take and then completely swing the other way. And I often do that to keep my actors on their toes. And so they don't really know, which also means that they have to stay in the moment. And also sometimes I'll give a really kind of bizarre di direction to one of the actors and then just tell my other actor not a specific direction but just like react off of what they're giving you just to see what happens and and that's what I what I mean about playing I really like to because I think there's only you can rehearse yourself to death I think but there's only that golden you know few hours where you have everything as it should be which is the actors in costumes playing their characters you know the camera's there it's all set up to go and you're in the space itself and I think you have to try to capture something that feels really real and organic and spontaneous and interesting um, and true as opposed to um, just you know hitting the lines as written and then turning the camera around so you can get some coverage I mean that is just not the way that I like to work. And what's the response to the film been like, particularly in the Chinese speaking world? I mean, have, has, have you been surprised by any reactions? Like, is it, what's the journey been like? I actually don't know that much. I mean, I should probably ask. Um, it came out while I was deep into Birds of Prey. So I don't know as much as I should probably about the reaction. Um, I don't, I mean, I don't, it certainly did not make its money back. I'll say that. But I didn't, I don't think it ever was going to. I mean, I think that it's a very, very nascent indie, if at all, indie um, film industry there. And frankly, I think that 
Um, I am just lucky to have been able to make the movie when I did. I'm not even sure in, in this current political climate wh whether um, a movie like Dead Pigs would be allowed to be made or um, be allowed to be distributed. But certainly this has led to a lot of big things for you, Kathy, and congratulations. I can see why people saw this and, and felt like there was, that you were ready for something big. Um, so so to tell us, can you just talk, what, how, whatever you would like to share about kind of what led to, you know, you'd getting the Birds of Prey directing gig. That would be lovely. Yeah. I read the script and I felt like there was, you know, it was the distant cousin of a lot of elements of Dead Pig, uh, both in tone, also in the ensemble of it, that we are, we're sort of following these different characters and they come together at the end. And I felt like, you know, it it spoke to me, actually. I really liked the themes of the script and what the, mov the movie's intent was, which was to... Um, for me anyway, and, and this is how I pitched it, was very much a female rage, you know, and... and, and um, almost Tarantino-esque in a re revenge fantasy of sorts. And, and that was what I found really compelling was like, could we take something that um, was maybe originally even not even marketed towards women a lot. If you look at some of the comics of these characters, um, they were definitely not marketed towards women. Um, and, and this sort of more, um, you know, a conservative or traditional system of comic book movies and superhero films and then subvert it on the inside. Um, and that's what I found really compelling and interesting about birds um, and the ability to do that because I don't think I'm, I, I just, I don't care to um, just make a big movie to say I made a big movie. But for me, it was that intent. It was the intention to subvert and talk about female rage within a somewhat patriarchal system um, that I found so interesting. Yeah, I loved it. And and I'm not the audience, the typical audience, and I loved it for all the reasons that you just said. And, and I think, yeah, we've got a lot to be angry about. <laughs> and I thought I, I, I thought you riffed on some really great, it's, it's a very knowing film, but it's also um, stylistic be playful and yeah I thought you did a fabulous job and I, I, I'm not surprised that you're busy but can you just talk about like how do you use this newfound influence that you have like what and what are you doing next? Yeah that's a really good question. I'm trying to make the most of it I mean I, I do feel a responsibility I feel very much I have seen um, the way that indies work um, and a very small indie, like almost like even outside of the indie New York indie world, but like so far out, I was in China indie world. Um, and then I, I, I was like in the middle of the studio system and LA and um, trying to understand that whole system. And I think I'm one of the few so far that have uh, been, you know, not white men that have been able to do something like this. And so I do feel much, very much a responsibility to, to not just continue to work because as a filmmaker, that's all you want to, uh, all I think anyone wants to do, right? Is like, how do I get to make my next thing? Or, you know, what what other story can I tell? Or what, el what other challenge am I, you know, can I throw at myself? Certainly that's what I'm always thinking. But I st I've started actually a production company with uh, a, my producing partner, Ash Sorohia, and um, our company is called Rewild. And um, by definition, that is to return to a self-willed state. And that was um, very deliberate as well. And in a way works well with Dead Pig coming out later because it's going back to my instincts and, and it's saying like, how can we not just support myself as an as a, as a artist and, and to try to hone my voice in a way that allows as much of it to get out there unfiltered as possible, but then how do we support other people who may not have had the same opportunities or the same chances that we've had? So we're working, I mean, we're working with like an old, actually we're working right now on, um, on a project, uh, on a TV project with David Rizdahl, who was in, um, Dead, who plays Sean Landry in Dead Pigs. And he's someone that I had casted in my first short film ever at NYU. We're also working with another friend of mine who was in the same short film um, that we now have a show with. And so there's a lot of that happening where I, I wanna try to find people that I love and that um, I love collaborating with and just give them some of those opportunities. And a lot of those people happen to also be, you know, women or people of, people of color and give those, give them opportunities and, and, and try to help them have sustainable careers. And I think it's also important and um, 
for all of, all of us, any filmmaker, any director to be thinking about having a sustainable career as well, um, especially if you are a person of color or a woman and how do you do that? And what are the infrastructures that, like an institutional support that you need in order to um, just keep going and to stay busy and to get to make the stuff that you wanna make. I love what you did with the casting of Birds of Prey. It doesn't look like the cast do not look like every other f film of its ilk. Yeah. So, you know, the impact of that, it felt really fresh as well. Like, you know, it's really impressive to see that you really are walking the walk and talking the talk. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it was always very, I, I was like, it has to feel like a Motley crew. It can't, it, it should just feel like they should not be together, but they are. This is not a sorority of, you know, hot young women that all like naturally belong together. I mean, that was, I wanted them to be a little more representative of women at large. And so um, just to, we'll, we'll round up and what, what's next, um, Kathy? You just touched on a couple of projects, but sort of what's getting most of your focus at the moment, feature-wise? <laughs> so much stuff. I mean, I, I'm definitely continuing to sharpen my um, journalism skills. I think that, you know, there's been, it's a really, I, I really believe that there's going to be really interesting stories and in art coming out of this time period because, just the same way that I had focused so much on China because China had, had seen such um, incredible change and so much drama, frankly, right? That was happening. And therefore Dead Pigs was about that. And now I'm like, oh, I don't have to look to China. I mean, look, you know, <laughs> I live in New York. It's like, look, look around us, look at America, look at, you know, all these things that we're dealing with that I think we've been sort of um, not, paying attention to, um, but have always been there. And so I feel very, um, very invigorated right now. Like, I just feel like there's so many stories that I wanna tell, reactions to things that are happening. And, I, and I'm really excited to see what, not just what I do, but you know, what our collaborators are thinking about um, and what other, other filmmakers are gonna do, because I really believe that like, this is just a good time for art and, and it might have to be very innovative and um, you know, we might have to get it out there in a different way and we'll have to figure out how to pay for these things. But I do think that the essence and the quality of the storytelling is just gonna um, elevate itself because of the shit that we've gone through recently, you know? And, and so a lot, we're developing a lot and we're developing um, everything from podcasts to television to feature films. Um, I'm writing another one called The Freshening. Um, and I, you know, I really wanna to continue to just challenge myself and not stick to a genre, always thinking about how to subvert the genre and, um, and, and, and talk, about, talk about things that are meaningful to me um, and um, that are not so easily um, packaged in a bow that, you know, ask some really interesting or pr provocative questions, but are not meant to, um, you know, always give, give you a happy answer, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful, a, a woman to all of that. And just finally, um, you know, we lift up films that are written by women, directed by women, or based on a book or a story by a woman. So is there anything that's that you've seen recently or any particular artists who you're, you're who, who are exciting you? That, uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I love, I think there's so much innovation happening in television and I just, I love I May Destroy You. I think what Michaela Cole's doing is just, so good and it's yeah I just I love what she's doing and, and the way that she's playing with form and even just like what is the definition of television right like they're almost these like beautiful cinematic short stories within um, somewhat of a timeline but like the freedom that she has to just play around with the themes um, of her show is really interesting and I think deserving of like so much praise and more praise than it's even getting Wonderful. Okay, we'll we'll wrap there. We're dead on time. Kathy, <laughs> that like flew by. That was beautiful. It was so like wonderful to talk to you and meet you. And congratulations. Dead Pigs is wonderful. And I'm 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 sorry it took so long to come out, but thank thank God for Mubi and we're promoting it and bringing bigger audiences to it. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.